Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, and I'm here up in Brennan uh, Vineyards in Comanche, Texas. And uh, I'm here with Rebecca Connolly. Right, Connolly, right? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Sometimes I forget last I know. names. Sometimes people say Connolly, things like that, but I'm Connolly. Connolly. Oh, yeah. so, I'm so see, I said it right the first time. You nailed it. Yeah. Um, so we are hanging out here. We're going to try some awesome Texas wines. This is going to complete the quintet of Texas fine wine wineries that I finally have visited all five of the Texas fine wine. I'll let Rebecca kind of talk about that because I don't think Has Julie anybody or told you about it? Julie or um, Shame on them. or Ron, uh, Ron, we would they actually never came up. So <laughs> okay. that's okay. Um, and I've already been to went to Dukeman way before actually I've been to Dukeman before yeah, the whole a few times. <laughs> before the actual like Texas fine wine ever came mm -hmm. around. I went to Bending Branch last year. So those are the five uh but let's let's listen Pedernalis um, Spicewood. It's kind of funny. Ron Yates isn't. It's, yeah. It, well, yeah. Spicewood but Spicewood, is, yeah. yeah. Spicewood, Bending Branch, Brennan, and Dukeman. Those are the five that are part of that organization. And we'll, we'll get to that with, with Rekka. And we're going to try some cool stuff. And uh, if you've never heard of Comanche, Texas, that's not under, that's understandable because yeah. it's a pretty small town and um, it's not exactly a you know, on the on the 290 yeah. trail. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we like to call it the gateway to the hill country. Yeah. So if you're coming from the Metroplex, we hope to be your first stop on the mm -hmm. way to the hill country. But uh, we're just the gateway to, yeah. to everything. And so. I can tell you this trip, um, this is the first time I've been up here. Uh -huh. And the trip up here was really cool because I'd never seen this part of Texas. It's pretty cool. Um, I have been to Cleveland's up the road, right? Yeah, kind yeah, of. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, it's a roundabout. Um, I, I may have passed through here, but it was probably 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a part of Texas I've really never had ventured to, so it was mm -hmm. kind of cool to see that. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it's the gateway to the whole country, so you, there mm -hmm. are hills over here. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just flat. And yeah. yeah, so Rebecca, why don't you kind of talk about your Always. background and then yeah, how did you decide sure. to come over here? Yeah, so um, I am uh, the Chief of Operations for Brennan Vineyards. I've been here for six and a half years now and uh, have kind of grown up here in Texas wine. Um, I It's ironic, we're talking on September 11th uh, because before I came to Texas, I was in New York uh, oh, wow. working for a hospitality company there and was kind of at the resurgence of the rosé um, craziness. Uh, we used to sell rosé by the bottle for people to drink during the day and dance on tables and do all sorts of wow. wild things. Bottle service during the day with brunch uh, was kind of our motto. So my start into wine started there in New York uh, with wines that I will probably never be able to afford to drink again. <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, But it gave me a great foundation. Mm -hmm. um, I, not a lot of people can say that their first uh, legit wines were Perrier Jouet, uh, Brut Rosé, and, and things of that nature. So um, hopefully I get to drink those again one day. <laughs> um, but times are a little bit different. I came to Texas, um, I'm originally from Texas, but came back to Texas in 2008 when the market crashed. Because mm -hmm. lo and behold, people didn't have a lot of extra income to be spending day drinking and mm -hmm. dancing on tables. So uh, I found myself back in Texas and went to the University of Houston for hospitality and restaurant management, fell in love with wine further. Uh, had a great professor, Kevin Simon, who actually just retired from U of H this year. Um, studied wine, took my introductory sommelier there, which I was super blessed to have offered to me through that program. and got to the point in my degree plan where it was time to start talking about hotel accounting and revenues and all sorts of things. I was like, I want to stick with wine. So made my way up to Texas Tech University. They had just established a viticulture and enology program and studied winemaking and grape growing there and finished out my bachelor's there doing that. So I've got a little bit of front of house experience, a lot of uh, winemaking and viticulture experience, and I landed in a marketing position. So mm -hmm. I kind of get the best of both worlds. I get to do front of house, back of house, um, be on the road talking Texas wine and joined Brennan Vineyards in 2013. My husband and I moved to uh, Brownwood, which is just about 30 miles over, and um, came in to see Dr. Brennan and said, you know, I've got 
I've got my introductory sommelier. I have a degree in winemaking and viticulture. And they said, well, we're not hiring. And I said, I'll volunteer. Um, so I came uh, to work and volunteered. And about a month later, he said, I'd really like you to take over our sales and operations. Um, nice. So I've been here ever since. And it's been a wild ride. And we've grown a lot. And the industry has changed a lot. Um, the wines are across Texas today are fabulous. Um, when I first started, you know, it it wasn't all that uncommon that you might run into a flawed wine here or there, mm -hmm. but it's actually very challenging to run into flawed wines today in, in Texas wine. Um, you know, every region has bad wine. They do. Um, that's that's the secret that nobody ever tells you is that you can go to you can go to California and run into bad wine all day long. Mm -hmm. um, but every region's got got its downfalls. Um, but in Texas also, but it is challenging to find them today. They're not jumping out and glaring at you. I, right, I feel yeah. like. So um, Comanche, Texas, is where we are based. Uh, Brennan Vineyards was established back in two thousand and one originally as a grape grower. Um, Dr. Brennan purchased uh, the McCrary House, which is a 1867 stone home built by one of the uh, early Texas Rangers. He was actually a member of the Frontier Battalion before the Texas Rangers were called the Texas Rangers. Um, and so they purchased it and weren't really sure what to do with it. He is a retired uh, chief of staff for Harris Methodist Fort Worth, and uh, which is now Texas Health, I believe. And wasn't sure what he was gonna do with the place. It was kind of his vacation home, a mm -hmm. place where they could come and be 90 miles from Fort Worth and still be within the call range and get back to Fort Worth, but also get out of the city. Okay. And um, he wasn't sure what to do with it. And his good friend, Dr. Richard Becker said, well, why don't you plant some grapes? And so Dr. Brennan and Trelise, his wife, the matriarch, they set out on a mission to find the best grapes and what to plant and evaluated their soils and inadvertently purchased the property which you filmed earlier, uh, mm -hmm. which is about 30 acres that sits adjacent to this track and was originally owned by the same people. So it's kind of bringing it back to the same ownership. Um, and they planted Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Malbec, Syrah, and Viognier. And those are the original plantings from uh, 2001. The Cabernet fell to a demise about two and a half years ago. Uh, it had a fungal trunk disease called ESCA. Okay. Um, which yeah, I don't is, hear about ESCA very often. Yeah, you don't yeah. hear about ESCA. Um, it's really sad. Um, beautiful, beautiful big Cabernet vines. And it's it's a virus that lays dormant um, or a fungus that lays dormant in the in the system and, and can come out at any time. So with the stress of Texas weather and all those things, it, it shortly met its demise. Um, but, so those were the original plantings. Uh, Dr. Brennan and Trelise fell in love with wine on a trip to California over a bottle of 1976 Stag Sleep Cabernet Sauvignon, which they drank out of Dixie Cups in a state park sitting on a rock. Um, and so that was what started awesome. it all for them. So <laughs> that's, that's Cabernet great. holds a huge place at Brennan mm -hmm. Vineyards. Um, you know, it's probably i haven't seen the statistics but i would still say it's one of the most widely planted grapes in the world and and people love it so um we'll talk a little bit about cabernet sauvignon as we go through the tasting um but we built our winery in 2003 it was started mm -hmm. it opened in 2005 so 2020 is our 15 year anniversary we actually did a 15 year anniversary gala virtual tasting this year we had big plans for everybody to wear bow ties and dresses and things of that nature. Um, but instead, we all just got dressed up at home and drank wine and talked across the uh, across yeah. the internet. Yeah, so that was definitely things that we did not foresee in our plans for 2020. Um, but moving on to Texas Fine Wine, Brennan Vineyards is one of the founding members of Texas Fine Wine. And Texas Fine Wine was established back in 2014, so shortly after I started here, uh, as a group effort, group effort to take on the wine industry in Texas. Um, at that time, the state had cut funding for Texas Wine as a program, and so 
this group of wineries, Brennan Vineyard, Spending Branch, um, Paternalis, Dukeman, and then um, Ron Yates from Spicewood, who joined in 2015, I believe. Um, they decided to take on take on the world. Mm-hmm. Um, they said, you know, just because the state's not available to do this for us, we can't lay dormant. Uh, we've got to put ourselves out there and make sure the world knows about us which is probably right about the time that I met you Mm -hmm. um, in San Antonio. We came down and did a tasting. It was one of my first trade tastings. And, um, you know, it's just been fast and furious ever since. We have been all over the place with Texas Fine Wine uh, just this past year. We traveled to New York uh, with TDA, who is now um, able to market Texas wine again. And then um, Jen McInnes from Bending Branch and I, we went out and uh, poured wine for a crazy bunch of folks in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, We've never worked so hard in our life, uh, but wine for normal people. Yeah. uh, We went and got to represent Texas for that. So it's it's been a crazy ride. But, um, you know, Brennan Vineyards were in Comanche. So one of our our biggest um, struggles, and I would also say best advantages, is that we are not in an ADA. Um, in in one sense, it's hard because when people are at the store and they're purchasing wines, there's all sorts of regulations as to how you can label your wines. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of our wines, if they're a blend of two different areas, end up being labeled Texas. Um, if we throw in, for instance, any of our, in our Tempranillo, if we do any blending with Texas High Plains, we've got to label it Texas. Um, the other downside is that while we produce a lot of estate wines, because we're not in an ABA, we don't get to market that. Um, so we do a lot of labeling as far as a county basis goes. Mm-hmm. You'll see a lot of Comanche County, and everybody says, where the heck is Comanche? Um, <clears throat> well, we are 90 miles southwest of Fort Worth, and I like to tell people, the geographic center of Texas. Uh, We're about 30 miles off of that. And um, Austin loves to think that they're in the middle of Texas and that they're the center of it, but they're not. Um, (laughs) So if you put your finger in the middle of Texas on the map, you're gonna gonna land pretty close to Comanche. Okay. So Comanche is a really interesting place. Um, It is an early, early foundation in Texas history. Uh, The town of Comanche was incorporated in 1856. Um, The McCrary's, who built the house that we call home here at Brennan Vineyards, they came to Texas in the early 1860s from Louisiana and uh, had, had left the Confederate Army and were looking for for new horizons and came here and built this Austin Stone home that we call home. Uh, In the records, we actually have all the receipts for it, which is wild. Uh, They spent, I think it was roughly $5,000 building this home out of Austin Stone. That's a lot of money for back in the day. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But they were, um, it's, it's kind of funny how, how it has ended up being an agricultural business. Uh, They, or he was a very famous um, horticulturist in Texas in the early days and actually had the Creekside planted to grapes back in the day um, and ran the town's first cotton gin and had the town's first general store, which later became um, Higginbotham Company in around 1900. Okay. Um, so Comanche is historically a very neat place. Uh, it's interesting to to be in the wine business in it today and be marketing Comanche County for a lot of our wines. Um, and we end up telling this story a lot because because we need people to understand the basics of it because while we market the Comanche County ABA, uh, it doesn't show up on a map. Um, every county anywhere is, is an ABA and that's a, a very defined area that you can can say a wine comes from. And so, I mean, the way that I always learned wine was that the smaller the area, the better the quality. Mm -hmm. Uh, You knew exactly where a wine came from and you could make that direct correlation between a wine and its provenance and its location. Um, My husband, who's not here with us today, uh, our vineyard manager, Travis Conley, 
he is, and I should say Dr. Travis Conley, I'm not uh, the best at doing that. Um, (laughs) He's a soil scientist by trade and um, has taken over the vineyards and done a fabulous job. Uh, But we have been on a mission for several years to establish an ADA here in the area that would represent Comanche County. to be one of those ABAs that shows up on the map. Right, yeah, um, exactly. And so we've gone through several trials and tribulations. You'll hear a lot about the Cross Timbers ABA. They have formed a, uh, a winery association that is um, actively working towards that. Um, we focused in about a year ago and said, you know, it's just too big. We don't we don't fit with that. And um, you were talking about the topography driving up here and mm-hmm. what an interesting part of Texas it is. Um, we fall just between the high plains and the hill country, so we're kind of in a low spot. Um, it's it can be an issue uh, in years like 2013 and 14, which it was an issue for all of Texas. Um, but cold weather tends to settle here. Uh, not as bad as Brown County, because you drive over to Brown County and you're down in a hole and the wind doesn't blow and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, but from the Newburgh Vineyard, which is our, I, I like to call it our second estate vineyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not attached to the property, but it is all Brennan Vineyards. Um, so we've got Newburgh and we've got here in Comanche in town. And, um, you know, we're really on a limestone bed, um, but we have really nice undulating clays, limestone weathers into a clay. Um, but you get out to Newburgh and you got a, a crazy little sand profile that comes through and it's it's very interesting. The uh, the arbor changes throughout this area. We're in the cross timbers. You, you have um, a little more um, oaks and pines and things of that nature going up towards Oklahoma. Uh, the topography is really a little bit different here. You get a lot of um, for vegetation, a lot of mesquites, a lot of oaks, uh, but it's it's kind of this happy marriage of the high plains and the hill country. Okay. And so, um, you know, we like to, for a little while, we, we looked at the uh, geophysical region of the mesquite rolling plains, and we really settled, and, and it's become prevalent to us the longer that we've researched it. Um, that this is the limestone cut plain. And so that is our um, active goal is to establish that. What we have also learned is that it's a really long process. It's not something you can rush in Texas. Um, but, you know, from a business standpoint too, we're kind of off on our own and, and we don't have all the hill country drama or any of those things either. So yeah. we're kind of in no man's land, but also in the middle of everything. So it's, yeah. it's a nice place to be. The winery opened 15 years ago uh, with really some some very basic wines. I don't think we ever dreamed 15 years ago that we would have the portfolio that we do today. Um, but we're also super excited to see new wineries popping up around us. Um, and it's, it speaks volumes to the quality of Texas wine and the growth of the industry. Uh, we've got two wineries down the road in Dublin, another here in Comanche, uh, one in Coleman, one in the Brownwood early area, some over in San Saba. And so we're kind of all clustering and growing. And good. And uh, even in my short time here, I've, I've seen that growth and it's, it's pretty fascinating and neat to see yeah. um, for an emerging wine region. And, um, you know, Texas is that we are, we are emerging. Uh, we see interesting articles all the time about how long Texas has actually been making wine and growing wine. Uh, Wine Spectator had a fabulous article the other day. I don't know if you saw that. No, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Some of the, some of the earliest evidence of winemaking is apparently linked to Texas. Yeah. And we have Valverde is the Mm -hmm. oldest in the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know North America, I think is Casa Madero in Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's the oldest in North America, but yeah, Valverde, which I eventually I'll go there, but I mean, it's um, kind of out in, it's, yeah. out in the other Del no man's land. Rio or Eagle Pass. Del, Del Rio? Valley? Uh, Del, no. Del Rio, I Del think. Rio. I, think it's, I think it's yeah. Del Rio. Um, yeah, that or Eagle, Eagle Pass. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Del Rio, I think. Anyway, it's, it's, it's out there yeah. in, on the Rio it's Grande. way, way out there. It's on the Rio Grande <laughs> in, in Westish, Texas. Yeah. Um, you know, that I, I don't think they've been a functioning winery all that time, but there was a winery called yeah. Valverde, and there's it's now it's still there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there's been Texas wine, there's been winemaking in Texas for a very long time, you know, starting with, you know, all the missions and all that, mm-hmm. just like all of, really all of Western United States, 
Um, that's that's how we got winemaking. But uh, yeah, and you know, um, so Rebecca's been talking about doctors. So mm -hmm. we actually have several doctors that have started wineries. So many doctors. It's <laughs> it, it's actually kind of it's funny. It's a common story. Yeah, even it is. in even other regions. Uh, one of the first people I had ever met in my life that owned a winery was Dr. Rivana in Houston, mm -hmm. um, who has Rivana wines in Napa. And yeah. we also have a place in Argentina and Oregon, I believe now. He's expanding. Yeah, they've got, um, now I feel wines. bad because if... Um, my idol made wine for him for a little while. So that is um, why I'm so familiar. And that but, is... Uh, Heidi Barrett. Peterson. Heidi Barrett. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yesterday when I was over at uh, Spicewood and we were talking about um, Ron was Ron kept you know naming a lot of people in the Texas wine yeah. industry and I kind of stopped said so the people that Ron's telling are telling you these are the equivalent of these people in Napa and yeah. the vast majority of people I remember I didn't remember a ton of people yeah. but I kept before they were these people yeah <laughs> but I would say it was like a lot of people I was remembering was the female winemakers and owners uh -huh. and for some reason that I just I don't know why I keyed in on that yeah but it's but it's also to prove a point that it's not just I mean I know it's a heavily male dominated thing but yeah you know there There's are female winemakers wine. and winery owners yeah. that are that are that are you know definitely trailblazing mm -hmm. in not just Napa and but elsewhere yeah yeah but yeah well women uh, and wine in texas is a whole nother interview um but uh, <laughs> yeah. there's there's a strong force and a strong presence and of women i know in texas. i know definitely yeah. quite a few myself included <laughs> yeah i know quite a few of the of the women that are involved in texas wine making mm -hmm. uh the texas wine industry and they're all yeah. awesome people and yeah. a lot of them i consider friends yeah. so i've known quite a few over the years but yeah you're you're right yeah there's definitely there's, a... that's a whole nother interview for a whole nother day <laughs> I, mean, I should get all of them together some point yeah Maybe, maybe next year, Texom, because you're all almost always there. Yeah. I know it's kind of hard to so do stuff fun. at Texom, but. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Poor Texom. I'm so sad. Coronavirus yeah. is just the worst. So. So um, speaking of Texom, mm -hmm. um, and it's already been a subject of the last couple of interviews, yeah. but yeah. let's 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 get the Brennan take yeah. on the uh, Texas Fine Wine uh, little blind tasting thing. Mm -hmm. And I get then I can on this interview get to talk about how I messed up this one, too. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I guess we can get to it because that will be, I guess, wine number three. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess we'll start with the first wine that you've already poured yeah. me. So we get into some Enjoy of the wines and then we can kind of talk about some other stuff mm -hmm. while we're doing that. Because we, we have a little while. We so have some wines I mentioned through. earlier um, that sort of my intro into wine started with rosés yeah. um, on the East Coast. Um, as far as Manhattan, New York City goes, and then in the summer we ran a lot of business out of the Hamptons um, and did a beach club there. Um, so I'm super thrilled that Texas has such a strong dry rosé presence. Uh, and it wasn't that way when I entered the industry. Um, I actually will probably never forget my first um, tasting session here at Brennan. And Dr. Brennan said, do you, I mean, do you think you can sell this? And I was like, yeah I've, yeah, I've sold it for thousands of dollars to people standing on tables in, in New York City. So yes, um, yes, I, I do think we can sell it. Um, but that was such an early conversation of, um, you know, 2013, 2014, of like, do you think it even has a place in the marketplace? Is it is it trendy? Is it a fad? And no, it's it's been around forever. It's just educating people on it. Um, but today, dry rosé is probably our number one white wine skew, and I throw it in the white wine category right. um, for Texas because because whites get chilled, um, and right. we just break it down real simple in Texas. Um, but this dry rosé is our 2019, mm -hmm. um, and it's actually almost even maybe a white wine. It is so pale. It is very pale. Yeah. Um, this is made from our Newburgh Vineyard Morved and is blended with Muscat of Alexandria, which okay. is a, a fascinating grape that we grow. Um, it is a 70-30 blend, uh, which is why it is labeled as just generic dry rosé. It's far from generic. Um, I hate that I even use that word. Uh, but this is our classic dry rosé, and that's okay. kind of a classic blend for us. We um, made our first Maved Provencal style dry rosé in 2014, and was a huge hit. Um, it went to San Francisco International and brought home a double gold there. And this is kind of the base blend of that wine. Okay. Um, that was a big year for us and a big year for Texas at San Francisco International 
Um, we were the first Texas winery to win two double gold medals in a year. All right. Um, or in a competition with them. Um, and so that was a big deal. Um, kind of one of the first of the accolades uh, during my tenure here. Yeah. But um, very floral, yeah. very lush. Um, I adore this wine. Nice light, nice mm -hmm. light red fruit in here. And I do get the floral. Sometimes with rosés, mm -hmm. I don't get a lot of floral. Mm -hmm. It's just more like just this fruit stuff. But well, the floral is definitely a nod to the Muscat of Alexandria, um, which is a truly bizarre grape that we grow. It's not a common planting. Um, we planted that in our Newburgh vineyard. I would say it's probably roughly 13 years old at this point. Um, and it's essentially a table grape that we make wine with. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, it was a winemaking grape, but you see these clusters. And when we talk table grapes or wine grapes, you know, you're talking palm of your hand. Mm -hmm. Not You don't really see a lot of big stuff. These are, no lie, 18 inch, like from wow. elbow to end of fingertip, full big clusters. And what you would associate with um, grapes at the grocery store, large, large berries. Uh, we actually purchased a new harvester this year because our, our old blue died on us and it has a sorting table on it. And we had to spend probably about two days widening out the sorting table oh, so wow. that the grapes would even be able to go through it. So um, it was kind of a, a wild experience to go yeah. from dealing with traditional berry sizes that are, you know, traditional in size. And right, then, yeah. uh, then you move to a large format grape and you're like, oh, I've got more work to do. So this is a traditional blend for us at Brennan Vineyards. Definitely unconventional for rosé, um, but more bad and Muscat of Alexandria. So I, I like this. I like this uh, blending here. Mm -hmm. um, really great bright acidity to it. Um, with with the the Muscat, you're you're definitely getting that floral and you're getting some really interesting flavors out of it. Um, Morved is just always a really fun grape yeah. to to play with. Mabed is, um, if Todd joins us, our winemaker here in a little bit, he'll tell you, um, but in case he doesn't, I'll tell you, it's, it's our least favorite grape to work with. Um, I think it's a clonal selection issue for us, maybe even a site selection issue. Um, but it's funny because I can pick up on Mabed almost anywhere I go, um, particularly in rosés, uh, because I get this little brioche toast nose okay. from it. It's kind of got this... Um, yeasty quality i would even say on the aroma to me All right. um it's not an overly fruity not an overly floral wine for us but you get this wonderful um fresh baked bread note and i love it um but rosé holds such a great place in texas from a pairing aspect um i don't know if I'm sure you have run around with Jason Heisaw at some point. At some point, at yeah. At some point. Jason, yes. Jason is, so, um, Jason is really a huge advocate for Texas wine. Mm -hmm. you know, he's been doing it for like a couple years now with the distributor he yeah. works for. Probably two years And, um, yeah, and he's got some, he'll come out and do uh, uh, industry stuff, mm -hmm. and he has a great presentation. And it was great because he highlights a lot of Texas wines and it's not just the stuff yeah. that he represents because he's, and a lot of Texas mm -hmm. wineries and a lot of people in the industry are all like, look, yeah, we have our wineries and you're, you are the competition, but you're also our, oh, yeah. it's also like, you know, uh, uh, you know, if all, all ships rise, whatever the, whatever the phrase is, you know, you want the whole industry to, to improve and, and rise mm -hmm. up. So you work together to get your industry to rise up and not just be, you know, all about yourself. And Jason also does that with his presentations. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just whatever he represents. Um, it's wines from across the spectrum right. of, that are really good from Texas. So, right. And um, now he's awesome. I like Jason a lot. Well, Jason is a huge barbecue foodie. Yes. Um, big keto guy, all those things. Um, and so uh, really one of the iconic pairings for dry rosé in Texas. It doesn't even necessarily make sense scientifically, but dry rosé is fabulous with barbecue. Um, it's got the acidity to cut through the fat, mm -hmm. um, kind of sort of the muted, more delicate aromas and notes that don't compete with the smoke or the hickory or the pecan, so be it whatever you choose. Um, but that acidity to be able to combat the fat, it just makes for a beautiful pairing. And there's nothing like 
ice cold rosé and barbecue. So mm-hmm. fabulous Texas iconic pairing right there. I've done it a few times. Yeah. I may have mentioned it on a on a prior yeah. episode or two on about a rosé about barbecue. Yeah. I do at least. I also definitely rec- I I will reference barbecue a lot with red wines, but I'm sure <laughs> they're sure in my back catalog right. of 534 episodes. I've, I've at least mentioned a rosé and barbecue. I hope so. For sure. But uh, yeah, no, I like this rosé a lot. You know. For me, with rosés, we talked about being able to, like the same event in it. I find that um, I tend to notice Cinso in in rosés if it, like it's a yeah. significant amount. Um, Grenache. I also seem to be able to uh, notice Pinot Noir, but I think it's mm-hmm. because Pinot Noir rosés are so different than your standard like right. Grenache Syrah, you know, the Rhone variety rosés that um, there's a difference to it. So I think that's that's where I get that, but we'll go no, back. this one's a really Sorry. nice one too. Yeah. So, um, you know, Mavet's a traditional rosé grape. Um, however, you see folks like Ron Yates um, who are making rosés with Tempranillos, mm-hmm. um, maybe slightly less conventional. Um, but I love Marved for for rosé for us. Um, this year we had plans to to do some rosé with Nerodavila. Okay. Um, that would didn't be cool. necessarily work out for us. Uh, 2020 is going to be one of those vintages, but it's just um, it's going to be a difficult one. The the wine yeah. that you get from it is going to be fabulous. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just not a lot of it, so um, it's definitely a special vintage. Uh, maybe not a special year, but special vintage for mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> yeah, um, Todd. So when I got here, uh, I was able to talk with Todd for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of just get an idea of what was going on just you know for yeah. him and also with uh talking with julie and ron uh and the slate mill people the uh, the subject of, of the vintage has come up and you know definitely like lower yields yeah. Yeah. but you know you're still got the quality yeah. you still have the quality here you're just going to have lower yields yeah no and it's um it's the beauty of being a farmer at the heart of this this is farming and mm-hmm. and um it's it's not made for the faint of heart that's for sure so uh, you got to be able to look through it and see the beauty in, in you know, a small quantity. Uh, but the, the quality of fruit coming in was unprecedented for us. Um, right. it will be a, it'll be a record book quality year. Uh, just like I said, not going to be a lot of it. So for, for those who haven't experienced cellaring yet or are just diving into it, this is going to be the year that we start talking about um, how you purchase wine and how you store it and and being sure to hold on to it mm-hmm. and, and understand vintages. So that's going to be, I think, a really big conversation point. We've got a lot of conversation points that we have with customers and industry is, is fairly cognizant of those. But that's also part of the big Texas struggle is Texas historically is is Dr. Pepper and sweet tea. Yeah. Um, and the customer and sweet has, wine. Yeah, yeah and sweet, sweet wine. wine. Yeah. Um, the customer's grown up with us. Mm-hmm. Um, we, as you're going to taste today, are putting all sorts of crazy things out uh, that we would have never dreamed would sell in Texas or that even the customer would enjoy. Right. Um, but they have 100% met us in leaps and bounds with with their taste profiles um so uh that being said dry rosé that was kind of the the kicker for you know can we even sell this and now it's our largest skew um, nice and it wasn't it wasn't trendy it wasn't a fad mm-hmm. um you and i both know that but, but yeah it was it was hard to see the the writing on the wall when we first started doing it exactly so we will move on to the v okay and this is 2019, our reserve Viognier. There you go. And we always talk about this, like, what does reserve even mean? Because, um, you know, we're in America and it... means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Well, legally. Um, legally, yes. It means something. It will mean something. You cannot but... look it up in a, in a dictionary about wine and say, what does reserve mean? Um, so for us, reserves... Um, we're going to taste a few of them today, but uh, they're very, very special. They're wines that we see fit. Um, we don't make reserves every year, mm-hmm. um, but they're wines that we identify early in the winemaking process as unique, special, um, and have character that is unprecedented in the glass. Um, 
So this is a small block of Viognier from our Newburgh Vineyard, which is okay. about 10 miles south of here, um, in a teeny tiny little town called Newburgh, Texas, that shockingly used to have like 4,000 people in it. Um, I don't know where all those people lived because there are not 4,000 houses, <laughs> but um, they had a hospital, they had a school, they had all sorts of stuff, but now it's kind of a little bit of a ghost town. Okay. Um, but this comes from a small block of Viognier. Uh, we are incredibly proud of it. It's um, very terroir driven. Early in my career of wine, I was not sold on terroir, period. Period, period, period. I think it takes time um, to understand. Oh, it, it takes time and it takes maybe um, connecting with a location, a geographic mm -hmm. location, to really believe in the concept of terroir. Um, you know, there's days that I wake up and I'm still not there, but. I, I agree, I think I think there's times where um, maybe that particular wine doesn't yeah. express it. Right. But, it, you know, depending on the winery and, the, and, mm. and how it's made, sometimes I think, and not to use the word generic, but mm -hmm. it's like, it just tastes like wine. And it yeah. tastes like, and it maybe tastes it's like fine. a variety. Yeah. You know, and, and that's fine. And, Typicity, and yeah. it's not, it's not meant to be, you know, life changing, but then you get to those wines mm -hmm. that you're like, oh it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, I know it came from that area. Or even if you didn't know, you just like, you maybe handed a glass of wine and you're mm -hmm. told it's a great wine. You start mm -hmm. smelling it, you taste it and not like to try to do the blind tasting, you know, yeah. guessing game, but you're kind of like, you taste like, Oh wow! I know what this is. Like I know mm -hmm. it came from this area, and I know yeah. what the grape is, and all that. And, oh, for yeah. sure, for sure. And um, my palate is in the early days of understanding that. Uh, for Texas, um, RV and Yang tastes like RV and Yang to me. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I have preferential treatment, probably, um, or I'm biased. It's kind of yeah. like your children. Um, mm -hmm. But this comes from Newburg. Uh, this was picked a little bit earlier, so it's a little less on the phenolic side. Now, we did a virtual psalm camp, and you got to have the classic version of this vintage. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit different, um, and this is a low alcohol. This is coming in at like 12.7, so it was picked oh, very wow. early. Okay. Um, so the phenolics are not going to be as aggressive on this. Uh, you get a little more um, kind of tropical notes. Yeah. Um, I'm getting more fruit than floral less on Less bitters. This. Yeah. Um, I love this wine. It's very supple, um, very nice in the mouth. Um, it still has great acidity. It does. And what I pick up on on that finish is really more of a minerality character, which is where I'm going to loop this in with terroir. Yeah. Um, we have certain white wines that come out of this vineyard that I really, really notice. Um, sort of a salinity and minerality. Um, they're very distinct to me. Um, we're not tasting our um, reserve lily today, um, but our 2016 reserve lily was a dry muscat from that vineyard, a uh, dry muscat of Alexandria. And the minerality on it was mm -hmm. insane. Like if we had legit oysters in this neck of the woods, that would be my <laughs> oyster wine, as would this wine. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm really proud of this wine. I'm super happy with it. It's very unique bottling. Not all Viognier comes in this way. Mm -hmm. Viognier has that ability to sort of go haywire um, right before harvest. And so we don't always get the opportunity to pick it at a lower bricks because, um, you know, Texas heat. Yeah. Never you know, know what it does. For me with Viognier is that, I mean, in the classic sense of things, especially when we're mm -hmm. talking about um, Condru and all that, is that we're taught that Viognier is a low acid grape. So when I get a high acid Viognier, it mm -hmm. still messes with my palate. And, yeah. you know, I'm finding that um, California Viogniers in general are higher acidity. Right. Now, you know, it, it, it's confusing because I get all the floral, I get all the fruit mm -hmm. that I'm supposed to get from Viognier and there'll be, um, there'll be a viscosity to it. Now I don't get as much of a viscosity. This, right. probably this, this is, is a lean. Picker. Yeah, it's very yeah. lean, but you know, if I get all that, but the, you know, the, the acidity is high and I'm like, well, I don't get it. And it's, so it's something where yeah. in my, in my tasting and especially when we get to an exam side of things, I just need more experience and be like, yeah. it smells and tastes and drinks like Viognier, but it doesn't have these certain things. So it must right. be, if I'm getting an it exam, it else. must be from yeah. California because that's, I know it's not, right. I know it's not French. And well, that's only two, there's only two ways we're going to get it in our exam. And that's such a huge conversation. And I know we had that conversation uh, with the virtual Psalm camp about Texas wines. You know, they're not necessarily testable wines right now. No. 
Um, and a lot of that is we haven't identified ourselves as winemakers. We mm -hmm. are still planting all sorts of crazy grapes. Yeah. Um, and typicity is still being established for Texas wine. Right. Um, to me, typicity has been established within Brennan Vineyards. Um, I'm well versed enough with Texas wine that I can identify it in a lineup because I work in it every day. Right. Um, it's funny how it becomes your dominant leg, if if that makes sense. Yeah. But after having been in other wine ventures, it's so nice to go to things like Texan because it, it keeps you fresh. Yes. Um, because we sell Texas wine all day long and, and we make Texas wine all day long. But it doesn't necessarily fit the mold yet. And uh -huh. and it shouldn't because we're still forming the mold for right. Texas. Um, none of us ever want to have to be typicity, right? But um, to get the customer and the consumer and the industry identified with what Texas is, it's going to be a long haul because um, we're still learning that ourselves. Um, and while we are kind of a older growing region, we're very young in the sense mm -hmm. of things. Um, yeah, I find especially that, with quality wine. Yeah. You know. I find that over time, um, because I've been exposed to a lot of mm -hmm. good Texas wines, that I'm also in that situation where I at least will, if I'm getting a wine and I don't know where it came from and, and all that, that I'm getting better at saying, okay, Texas is a possibility. Right. Um, I mean, I have, I have called like legitimately called a wine from Texas and it was from Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, granted the one time that was the, that was the best at it was because the person yeah. who They're brought like, the bottle had used to work for a Texas winery. Clothes, yeah. right? like well, the sheep and clothes, right? Well, the person who brought the bottle, it was for our tasting group and it was like a bonus bottle because it uh -huh. wasn't part of our actual tasting. And she had worked, she had just finished working for a winery and uh, it was a cab and um, we're all at the tasting group and you know, everyone's identifying it's Cabernet Sauvignon. So we at least got that new world. Okay, we're good. Everyone's like California, like a Napa, Sonoma, whatever. And I, I just yeah. kept smelling and tasting. I was like, no, this is Texas. I'm, I'm telling yeah. you, this is a Texas wine. I'm usually not like a hundred percent certain, mm -hmm. but this one I am. Yeah. And I looked at her and I was like, did you, Texas bring, did you bring, did you bring Texas here? Like, well, <laughs> not just, uh, did you bring the actual, like you used to work at? <laughs> she was like, yes. I was like, I knew it. I but knew that was it. more like I said, it was Texas. Then I started going, okay, she's working with Texas winery. So then it was more like, I didn't, you know, calling producer. It was not mm -hmm. because I, I, cause I'd never had that person's wine. So it's not like I yeah. knew the wine. It was more like, okay, if it's Texas wine, then what Texas wine would you have brought? Sure. But yeah, but it, the, the idea is that Texas, can have a certain style mm -hmm. and aroma and flavors, yes. but I haven't gotten to the point where I know every single Texas wine is just like that. Yeah. So I'm gonna leave a little bit of this so we can do a little comparison well, shopping and, um, here. I'm gonna throw in here, it's Friday at noon and you may hear some doors opening because yeah, yeah, the that's doors fine. are open. Yeah, doors are open. So uh, here is, I have that. not had this wine in so long and I'm so excited to taste it. So is this the you one guys, that we had? had a, is this the one we had at Psalm Camp? Or is this an older one? No, this is a different wine. This one, okay. Um, so I just had a baby, so I'm so excited to have the wine. Yeah, right. Mark is spitting over there, but I am not. Um, well, this is, you don't have to drive anywhere anytime soon. I don't, soon. I don't. Um, this is our 2015 Seller Select Viognier, which okay. has a really fun story. Um, this is this is orange wine. Um, but orange is not actually a federally regulated uh, True term that. Yeah. in the United States. Um, we I wanted to just call it orange, orange Viognier with some subtext. I was going to be all artsy fartsy about it, and uh, they said no, people are going to think it's made from oranges. So we got rejected, okay. and, and we tried all sorts of terms. Um, I believe skin fermented is now a regulated term that you can use in in Texas and the United States. It wasn't when we made this. Okay. So this is a 2015. Um, hence the orange label. Orange label, yes. We thought that we would sell this to all the people that love that place in Austin. You know, yeah. Um, I'm from I'm from the High Plains, so so I'm not going <laughs> to talk about that, that place. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but we we color match pretty well with uh, UT Austin. And, yeah, you know. Um, you know. So this is orange wine. So this was kind of a a revolutionary, weird thing that we did back in 2015. I don't know what we were thinking, um, other than we were on to something really cool. 
So um, 2015 was a bumper crop year. We were following up 2013 and 14, which we had had decimating freezes. Um, and so the vines literally for two years have been storing up all this energy and all these nutrients and they weren't allowed to like get out and do what they wanted to do. So what, um, what ended up happening was that we had like so much fruit. I can't even tell you how much fruit. Um, this little vineyard over here threw out like 24 tons of fruit that year in, in a two acre block. It was a lot. (laughs) I mean, it was, it was beautiful and well kept and well cared for. Um, but it, it definitely was overcropped. Um, 2015 was a rough year for our classic Viognier, but it gave us fruit to play with, which is kind of fun. Yeah. So Viognier, um, at Britain Vineyards, I've told you, I think it's really special and nowhere else in the state tastes like our Viognier. Um, I'm just going to say that right now. But what we got to do was skin ferment. Um, and so we had read a couple of articles. We had been to Unified that year. We had learned a little bit about skin fermentation um, and the ability through skin fermenting to increase your press yields. Well, press yields were so rough. Um, and... Uh, when I say are so rough, they're really rough for Viognier, particularly our Viognier. Um, one ton of Viognier for us yields, in a good year, 120 gallons. Okay. Super low. Um, in a normal year, probably like 107 gallons, which is really, really brutal. Okay. So you've got to have um, a lot of acreage. It For us, it seems to be identifiable with a clonal variety selection. Um, which may be why our VNA tastes so different than everybody else's. Um, but so we set on this journey to um, skin ferment with the intention of blending it back. But we learned through skin fermenting, we started tasting it and we were like, this is super yummy. All right, yeah. It's got these, um, at that time, I mean, it's obviously matured and grown up in the bottle because wine's a living thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the time coming out of the tank, it was green apples and um, just these really interesting, you know, green apples I associate with malic acid and yeah. bitter acids. Um, and, and that's what it was. It was bitter and it was harsh and it was edgy and it was such a great food wine. Um, so we threw it in this orange label. And it was funny when we released it, it had no orange qualities whatsoever. It just looked like a really green Viognier. Okay. Give it about um, a year, two years. Um, and it really matured into this crazy pumpkin spice, amber, fall hued. I'm like, I'm so excited to have it next to the decor. Um, it just matured. And it is this really beautiful, high acid, almost red wine. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a lot of fun in the early days of releasing this because we had these wonderful black glasses and you could taste it next to reds and you had no idea that it was a white wine. Um, and so we went through this crazy learning curve with it of, um, and probably the hardest thing was bringing it to consumers. Don't chill it. Like, yes, it's Viognier, but please don't throw it in the fridge. Like it turns into an acid bomb that is like not palatable whatsoever. Like you've got to drink it like a red wine, slightly chilled. Um, and we recommend it with food. Like we're in the middle of, um, bird season just opened. Yes. Bacon wrapped, anything that flies in the sky. (laughs) Perfect. Like it's a fantastic pairing. Mm -hmm. Um, we've done this with veal. We've done this with short ribs. Um, anything that is really off the charts in that fat scale, fantastic pairing. Um, and it's funny, um, this is probably one of our very first experimental wines. And Dr. Brennan was like, what have you guys done? Um, but he's also been the person that the longer that we have this wine, he says, well, don't put that on sale. Like, I like that wine. It's too good. You cannot let that go at whatever <laughs> price you're talking about. So, cause in my brain, I'm like, move it, get it out of it, like get it out of inventory. Let's, let's go. Yeah. Um, and it's time to make a new one. Mm-hmm. Um, but something that we never dreamed about, and this is just part of being an emerging wine region and in a, you know, we're not new by any means. We've been doing this for 15 to 20 years. Right. Yeah. Um, but part of being newbies is saying like, you know, we made a white wine, like a red wine, 
but we tried to drink it like a white wine. And you can't do that. Right. Um, it's a red wine at heart. It's here we are five years later and it's just now hitting its really beautiful streak. Um, and even with a screw cap on it, you know, like they still oxidize and they still transpire some oxygen. So um, screw caps are awesome. I'm telling you, know, you, the color development in this, even with a screw cap is incredible. So I love, love, love this wine. It's got this creamy note, some spices. Um, yeah, it's savory. And the acids yeah. are just off the charts. It's really cool to to and the to, petrol. Yeah, who doesn't exactly. love to smell a little petrol? So, being able to like go flip between the two has been really cool because it's really like a tale of two different wines. I mean, the the base is there, oh. but you're getting like a really just a yeah. a really cool contrast. So we have put quite a bit of this back. Um, orange wine's known to age pretty well. Um, we're saving quite a bit of it, so it'll be fun to open mm -hmm. the longer things go. Um, well, because, you know, like you talk about being like a red wine, because it has all that skin contact, mm -hmm. you can taste or feel yeah. that that skin contact, yeah. what we call phenolic bitterness. This is what we call phenolic bitterness <laughs> in our white wine, but we don't, what we call it tannin on the red wine, mm -hmm. it's basically the same thing. Yeah. But so the tannins are are there and you get a little bit of extra grip mm -hmm. and yeah it adds to that body and yeah i mean it's a really cool well, one and then it's funny that you bring that up in a lot of our classic viennes um that are a little more developed mm -hmm. so this this reserve was harvested pretty early um it's a it's a lower alcohol lighter leaner style um but in our classic viennes you've got a really meaty almost chardonnay like body um and I remember when I first started here, I was like, this has some phenolics, some chew, like almost what I would call tannins. Mm -hmm. um, as I got to know our vineyard and got to know the fruit, I was like, well, you know, we are pressing the hell out of that. It is probably getting some yeah. some tannins from, from the press, from the skin, from the seeds, all of that. Um, but I would finally tell people, I was like, this is a white wine made for red wine lovers. Pair this with a ribeye any day of the week. Swish mm -hmm. it around your mouth. It has structure. It does. Um, and so it's it's fun to be able to illustrate that because everybody always says like, hmm, red meat, I need red wine. You don't have to have that. Depending on the region, depending yep. on where you are and how wines are made, you know, I'd put Viognier any day of the week with a hot summer ribeye. There you go. Um, and and so I may be a little unconventional in that aspect, but uh, a lot of Texas whites have the structure and the stability to do it. Okay. Um, you know, I can't say that for for California Viognier. That's pink no. grapefruit and and herbals and aromatics. Um, you know, that's that's classic white wine. It's mm -hmm. it's a it's a fish pairing. It's a it's a savory pasta pairing, um, but. But in Texas, they've got some some grit behind them, and and they can go with the big meats, which is crazy. They can. So, um, but through Texan, um, you know, we've featured this there a couple of times. I got to take it this last year to a polishing party, and it was so fun to pour. Um, they're like, excuse me, what? That's right. We had at the polishing party, right? Excuse me, what? You made orange Viognier in Texas? I who remember makes, that who now. Makes skin fermented Viognier. Like, that's a weird thing because it's phenolic in general, right? Yeah. Like, who wants to go there? But uh, we did it. So, um, So yeah, if you don't know, like, so as a volunteer, um, we get to polish 22,000 glasses Whoa. twice a day for like three days. And I then hope the, my girls over there working hard that 22,000 glasses. <laughs> Yeah, As ladies, if you ever want to really polish mm -hmm. glasses, come to Texom, and yeah. we have 22,000 glasses, too. Per day. Per day. Then we have per to day. flip. Oh, I hate polishing. They might yeah. do that. So, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I always take, I always have my, my traditional picture, mm -hmm. at least back when I was used to be in restaurants, I would take a picture of the stacks, the towers and towers of glasses, and then yeah. I would send them to my staff and say, don't complain to me about polishing your glasses, <laughs> because I'm doing a year's worth in five days. Right. Um, because the, the first like three or four days that I'm up there, cause I get mm -hmm. there on a Wednesday, we start on a Wednesday and by Saturday we've, we've casually mm -hmm. polished all 22,000. We really need them almost all done by Friday because introductory, uh, some yeah. is happening along with maybe some Which other a type lot of, of stuff. Yeah. So we really have like two days to do it all and then move wine and reorganize and 
So I anyway, we have polishing parties. Help. I just poured wine. Yeah, we have polishing parties, and yes, um, there is definitely lots of cool stuff. And I mm -hmm. do remember because yeah. I remember exactly where you were. I remember mm -hmm. where your table was. Yeah, I remember where every um, everybody. I remember, I remember where there, Yano, uh, Yano was there. So I remember uh -huh. Jason, Jason was there. Jason, Tony, you were Spencer, there. Myself, yeah. and um, Fall Creek. Yeah. Anyway, no, the point is that you know, yeah, we have these polishing parties, and we get to try really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we bring you guys the weird stuff. I mean, there are literally wines that we make just to take to Texan. Just fun. And we do get that. We, I mean, yeah. we get really cool things. We get a lot of stuff that um, um, the average person isn't necessarily going to get. We, they'll both theme it out. It'll be like certain regions of the world. Like in this case, it was Texas. Um, we'll have Burgundies. We'll have, mm -hmm. we'll have California stuff all kinds of stuff and we not every morning but a few mornings we'll start with champagne because uh, why not because you deserve it after polishing all those glasses <laughs> so real quick <clears throat> so this was not the wine that we had at the psalm camp but it was a viognier mm -hmm. and uh as i've already mentioned in the other interviews we had all these blinds and when we got to and actually ron and i talked about it mm -hmm. um because he thought I, he and i had the same thought so when we got to the Brennan wine, we knew uh, based off of the, the, it was the, the capsule and it was, screw, oh, yeah. it was screw cap. We're a dead giveaway. Was it was, it was Brennan. Yeah. And we, I was like, it's Lily. I, it, 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 it has, because it had about the same color. Mm -hmm. It was, because yeah. that was a little bit, that's a deeper, darker, mm -hmm. burnt orange, literally burnt orange. Um, but it had that, had that color. And I was like, this is Lily. I already know what this one is. And that was the first one that I could tell. The other ones I didn't know. Yeah. They, I did, I did happen to glance, um, because it didn't have the foil, the Pedernales mm -hmm. one. I saw the Pedernales logo, and I was like, "Well, that's probably Tempranillo because it's yeah. been known for." So yeah, when we got to that, and the guess, the the choices we had, Viognier was one of the choices. I was like, "No, no, it's not Viognier. It's whatever." It's not phenolic, right? Yeah, like it's, it's not as crazy on yeah. the Viognier scale. Yeah. So, and then when it was revealed, mm -hmm. I and and so on our side of things, we were just typing. We weren't on the video. We were typing and. I know. I, I wish think you I, guys had been on video because well, I don't know how many of us fun. there were, but yeah. I was. Probably, there were a lot. Yeah. I was one of the more <laughs> active people typing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's because I, I know almost I know I knew everybody that was in the panel, so I, it was easier for me to talk or type. But um, yeah, I picked the Viognier. I mean, I did not pick Viognier, and then I looked back at it, and I was like, "Well, I mean, the winemaker's Instagram handle is only Texas Viognier." Oh yeah. And I told that to Todd this morning. I was like, "Yeah, I totally Should've. was Should've. so. <laughs> I was so sure it was this. Yeah. I completely was blinded to what it was." And I'm not saying I would have gotten yeah. it because it definitely is a little different than what I'm used to. But so, um, yeah. Well, it's, and I'm, I don't know if Todd told you this morning. Um, 2019 was a super interesting year for us. Uh, we were able to make a lot of reflections about our wines. It was kind of a um, an unmaking of Brennan Vineyards. We wanted to go back and evaluate the wines, look at them, see what we loved about certain wines. And, yeah. and do we actually love some of the products we're putting out? Um, and consistently across the board, we blinded our Viognier, and Viognier is what we are known for. Mm -hmm. um, Classically, that's what we're known for. I think in recent years, it's been other things like Tempranillo, even um, Dry Rosé has really become synonymous with Britain Vineyards. Right. Um, so we took a look at it and kind of talked about like the wines that we take home to drink. And V&A wasn't high on our list. Um, not that there was anything wrong with it. We just didn't enjoy it anymore. And so we went back and we unmade it and remade it. And we have a wonderful contact with Scott Labs, who provides some of our fermentation supplies. And uh, we were able to communicate with them, like, hey, we just did this six blind Viognier from Texas. We were able to pick ours out, not from, from a fault, but it, it fell middle of the ranks. And we want to be at the top of the ranks of Viognier. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of had to go back to the scratch basics and remake okay. it, um, which is probably part of understanding um, Lily's got those soft, supple characteristics, and that's not what you associate with DNA, but we were like, it's it's too bitter, it's too phenolic. What, is it that we're pressing the heck out of it? Is it how we're farming it? Is What are we doing? Yeah. And so um, it really ended up being an interesting thing. We 
we inoculated with a commercially available wild yeast. Okay. And then, um, I can't remember, after like five bricks or so, we move in with commercial yeast. Um, and so we went through this whole new protocol and it came out and I was like, it, it doesn't smell this way anymore, but when it first came out of the tank, it smelled like banana Laffy Taffy. And I was like, can you do this all the time? That's like artificial banana. I just associate it with all of my childhood. And I was like, oh my gosh, we gotta be able to do this all the time. Um, but we talk about typicity and like, yeah. it's so not typicity for VNA, but right. my God, it was good. Um, it doesn't do that anymore. Um, it's very peachy and very mm -hmm. floral yeah. um, and very rich and lush. But at the time when it came out of the tank, I was like, <gasps> he just made my day. Um, but it was a it was a pivotal point. We were 14 years into making wine and it was kind of like, hey, guys, we, we don't necessarily love one of our wines anymore. And we've got to figure out how to fall back in love with me and Yang. Um, and so it was fun, and 2019 was the year that we fell back in love with VNA. So, cool. um, you know, that speaks to typicity in Texas. You just, the climate's ever changing. Um, granted, the soils aren't changing or anything like that, but the climate's changing and and our supplies are changing and our knowledge is changing and, and just continuing to grow as mm -hmm. growers is, is super important, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we're excited. Um, you got to look at two really cool Viognes today. They were both so, awesome. I, yeah. I, I love both those Viognes um, and the, for what they are. I mean, they're-, they're, they're The they're, farm girl in me loves the petrol in this. I'm like, oh, that's that's cool. Yeah. So, no, you know, I, nothing I, like the good smell of petrol. Exactly. So, and it's not from, you know, the Rheingau or... No, it's or not. Like um, I, I had the had the pleasure of having some 1990 um, Mosul Cabinet uh, from the Erziger, Erziger Garden uh, Grand Cru Vineyard. It was absolutely stunning. And uh, that was a couple, three episodes ago. Because what I did was I actually recorded my dinner. Mm -hmm. So all the stuff I paired Dig it. and, uh, yeah, that was a fun, that was a fun episode to record. I have no idea what it looks like cause I haven't edited it yet, but it was definitely Which a fun, one? um, I'll do your yeah, white I'll do that one, glass. Yeah. it was definitely a fun episode to record with, uh, having a pre-dinner cocktail, a champagne, a white wine, a I dessert come wine. I dinner with you more often. It, 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 the, the episode is actually called life with Mark. Yes. yes. Um, so when I go out to dinner, mm -hmm. Um, especially if I'm not driving, uh, or, if, or if I'm staying at the hotel, um, I like to start with a pre drink, a pre dinner drink of some sort. Mm -hmm. Then I like to have champagne or sparkling with my salad. So I don't necessarily get appetizers. Then my aunt, mm -hmm. my, my main course will have, you know, some type of mm -hmm. wine with it. And then dessert usually has something that mm -hmm. pairs well, usually a dessert wine. And then sometimes I'll have an after dinner drink, to just eat whatever, um, that particular dinner, the DJ Steve was Frenette Branca, which is I'm not really oh. a fan of. I know so many Psalms and wine oh, industry people love that? it because it's bitter. Everybody just turned off their recording. It's bitter <laughs> AF. <laughs> yeah. Now, it I, is bitter, but it's I so do good. <laughs> love IPAs, uh -huh. uh, whether they're traditional IPAs or hazy because they're, they're not bitter, but yeah. Um, it was good for what it was and honestly that was the first time i really sat down and really mm -hmm. like like smelled and tasted fernet mm -hmm. instead of just taking it like Evaluated. a shot like everybody yeah. else does yeah for sure <laughs> but yeah but that was a lot of fun so yeah um that uh it hasn't been edited yet but yeah that'll be that should be a fun episode because yes. dad's in it